It is well with my soul. What a strong affirmation of faith. Um, And what is it that makes someone capable of saying that? Even, Even when things in life may not seem so well. That's a question that we'll really be looking at uh, for the next few weeks as a part of this series. Uh, Before I dive into that this morning, though, I want to say this, you know, one of the things that creates that possibility for us is being deeply grounded in our faith. Um, Some of you, I know, saw the email that uh, went out on Thursday in the pastor's message. Uh, Others of you uh, may not get that email, and if you don't, we'd love to add you to the list. Uh, It's easy to sign up to be a part of that weekly email. Some of you may have have it, but it may be buried in all the email that's accumulated over the holidays and you haven't seen it yet. Uh, but so let me just real quickly share with you um, the invitation and the challenge that I put out on Thursday in the pastor's message. And it's what I call the 40 20 10 challenge that I promise you will make an impact in your life this year if you will take it on. Um, and it's much easier to keep a resolution in the new year when you do it in community with others than when you try to do something by yourself. So 40 uh, represents 40 weeks of the year that uh, part, the first part of the challenge is to commit to be present in worship, in a worship service, at least 40 of the weeks out of the year. Now 52 is ideal, but 40 gives a little bit of grace and recognizes that we all get sick or maybe you were out at a football game too late one particular weekend, but, but a minimum of 40 assures us that we are staying connected in worship, both with our relationship with God, but also with one another growing together. Uh, 20 represents 20 days out of the month or about five days a week, um, that a minimum of five days a week, you would take time to read something from the Bible. Um, no, no particular uh, guidelines on how much to read. You decide that. But I promise you that taking a little bit of time every day, and certainly if you do it five days a week, just pick up the Bible and do a little bit of reading. Uh, you will grow from that and you will begin to recognize things and see things and hear things that maybe you haven't before. Um, one of the things that I offered in the email was a particular plan for reading through the entire Bible this year. It's one that my covenant group, uh, eight other United Methodist pastors in Florida and I are sharing in together this year. And if you would like to have those readings, we'd love to include you. You can follow us on Twitter um, at NRSV Bible 365, or I can uh, add you to an email distribution list to get those on a daily basis starting this week. Uh, And then lastly, 10 is 10 minutes a day. Uh, Take 10 minutes a day to sit in silence and in prayer. And don't worry so much about filling that time up with talk, trying to say something to God. Uh, Just sit quietly and let God do whatever God wants to do with those 10 minutes. Uh, But find a place and a space where with everything else that you're going to be doing the rest of that day, set 10 minutes aside to just sit quietly and pay attention. So uh, I hope that many of you will take me up on that invitation and challenge and uh, we'll all see together what God does with that uh, among us. Um, Today, we're going to leap into this first series of the new year uh, that is called Why God? And uh, before we do, I'm going to invite you to join me in a word of prayer uh, for the year and for this particular morning. Oh God, we give you thanks for a new year that promises us the opportunity of new possibilities and new beginnings. We pray that this would be a year that we grow more deep, deeply in our relationship with you uh, and in our commitment to Christ and to serving Christ with our whole lives. Uh, And now as we start worship for this year, in these moments right now, uh, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and breathe life into my words uh, so that as I share, uh, they might carry a word from you into our hearts and lives this morning. Amen. So the title of the series is Why God Um, and Whose Fault Is It Anyway is the focus for this morning and the basis of the beginning of the book of Job. But I want to begin by telling you a little bit about a particular family that uh, I got to know a number of years ago. And when I first met them, they were living what they thought and what others around them would have thought seemed like the fairy tale life. Uh, High school sweethearts 
who had gotten married uh, as young adults had moved to Florida and they started to raise a family and by the, t- by the time I met them, they had three precious girls and uh, they had the house of their dreams in the neighborhood of their dreams uh, and they had their dream jobs and their whole world just seemed like it was picture perfect. Until the last day of preschool for their youngest daughter who had just turned four years old. And on that particular day, instead of being at preschool, uh, she was at the children's hospital closest to where we all lived. She was there because she had been having some symptoms that spring and they had started running tests and trying to figure out what was going on with her. And it was on that day that she and her parents and her sisters got the diagnosis that she had a rare form of pediatric brain cancer, which began a long and difficult and painful journey for her and her family and the many other people who loved them. Uh, And one year later, Peyton was gone. She died about a year after her diagnosis. And over the course of that year, um, Catherine and I had a number of people who knew them and who were asking the question, why God? Why, why in the world would this happen? Why is this possible? It's a question that is to be expected and understood when life doesn't go as planned or as we had anticipated it going. We all at some point ask, cry out that question, why God? <clears throat> And so this particular series in the month of January gives us a chance to look at that question and some of the other questions that go along with it, and to do so by using passages from the book of Job, a book that tells us a lot about pain and suffering and how um, we can address it and how sometimes we do that well and how we sometimes do that not so well. And where we can find good news in the midst of it all. The book of Job starts out with a, what I would call a once upon a time feel. At the outset of the story, we hear about a man named Job who lives in the land of Uz, which sounds a lot like Oz, which sounds like some far off, wonderful, imaginative place. Uh, and, and one of the first things that it's important for us to realize is that, is that in this story, um, whether Job was a historical figure or not is not really important. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But, but he seems to have this perfect life at the beginning, but, but things quickly deteriorate. And it isn't long before this once upon a time tale becomes a not so happily ever after story. And what we encounter in the book of Job, throughout the book of Job, is masterful storytelling that is written primarily to help people then and to help people now wrestle with the problem of pain and suffering and to help us in our search for God in the middle of it all. Now, I want to offer this warning up front. Throughout these next few weeks, I and Lenora and Catherine will have no tidy answers for you to the problem of pain and suffering. You see, the things that we can say, the things that we are able to honestly say, may not always feel completely satisfying. And they may not always be what we want to hear. But the truth of our real life experiences, both the ones that we have already had and the ones that are sure to come in our futures, demand that we be honest and not tell lies about the problem of pain and suffering. And the truth of those experiences will not allow us to wrap pain and suffering all neatly up in a package and put a pretty bow on it and say, this is how you deal with it. So with that as the backdrop, 
We'll begin today with the prologue. And the prologue is that part of Job that, um, that encompasses the first two chapters that really set the stage for, for the rest of the book. And it's there where we hear the very beginning that I already shared with you about this man named Job who has this perfect life. Uh, in the first few verses of chapter 1, we hear that he has a wife and he has 10 children and he has lots of property and lots of animals and lots of servants and he is well respected by all and he is a man who is perfectly obedient before God. And so one day in chapter one, uh, we hear that there's a gathering of the court of divine beings around God and they start having this conversation and, and there's a first conversation that happens in chapter one that ultimately ends up with, um, well, We'll go to chapter two, and I'm going to read for you today chapter two, but just know that the structure of chapter two parallels what has already happened once in chapter one, but some new things happen as well. So I'm going to stop a couple of points on the way just so that I can explain some things as we go and help fill out the picture of what is going on in this passage. So we'll pick it up at chapter two, verse one, and I think we have it on the screens as well. Yeah, there we go. So one day the divine beings came to present themselves before the Lord and the adversary also came among them to present himself before the Lord. Now, the adversary is an English translation of the Hebrew word Satan. Now, Satan in some translations gets transliterated into English as Satan. And so what immediately happens for some when you begin to read the story of Job is that you assume that this adversary who is in dialogue with God in the gathering of the human beings is Satan and that immediately leads some people to think of the guy who has horns and a pitchfork and is the ruler of the underworld. And I just need to tell you up front that, that is not, is, that's not what's going on here in the story of Job. The word Satan is actually a word that is used throughout the Hebrew scriptures to refer to any adversary of the people of Israel. So it's not a proper name. If you look in places like Kings and Chronicles where Israel is at war with their enemies and the, and the translation says their adversaries came, the word that is used there is the exact same word that is used here in Job. Hasatan, which translated means adversary. So we'll pick it up again now in verse 2, now that we've seen that the adversary is one of those divine beings who has come at this gathering with God. And this is the second time this has happened. It already happened once in chapter 1. And the Lord says to the adversary exactly what was said in chapter 1 again, where have you come from? And the adversary answered the Lord from wandering throughout the earth. The Lord said to the adversary, have you thought about my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a man who is honest, who is of absolute integrity, who reveres God and avoids evil. He still holds on to his integrity, even though you incited me to ruin him for no reason. Now, what God is calling attention to there is that in the previous chapter, the divine beings and the adversary have already come once and the adversary says to God, you know, okay, so there is this guy Job who is a man of perfect integrity, perfect obedience, but God, of course he's that way because you've made life perfect for him. Everything is going swimmingly well for him, so of course he is. But if, but if you take away the hedge that is around him, the way that you've protected him and made everything great for him, I'll bet you that Job will give in and Job will no longer be that man of perfect integrity or, or of obedience. And so the adversary is given permission in the first chapter to mess with Job. And so by the end of the first chapter, Job has lost all of his family. He's lost his property and so his hedge has been significantly reduced, but his own life 
has not yet been touched. His own physical being has not been touched. And so now Job is coming back and saying, okay, but, but, but there's still something there's still something left. And so then the, the passage continues. The, and the adversary responded to the Lord, skin for skin. People will give up everything they have in exchange for their lives. In other words, okay, other stuff may happen, but as long as something doesn't happen to my physical being, I've still got that. But stretch out your hand and strike his bones and flesh. And then he will definitely curse you to your face. And now notice that, there, let me go back to that again, if we can pull that back up, that last verse. But stretch out your hand and strike his bones and flesh. The adversary is inciting God to raise up God's hand against Job. But what we see in the response is that that's clearly not what's going to happen. So if we go to verse 6, the Lord answered the adversary, there he is, within your power, only preserve his life. And so the adversary departed from the Lord's presence and struck Job with severe sores from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. And Job took a piece of broken pottery, which is something he would have collected from the trash heap on the edge of town, to scratch himself and sat down on a mound of ashes. This man who is the most respected man in the community and had everything that he possibly wanted in life is now sitting with a broken piece of pottery scratching his sores. And Job's wife said to him, are you still clinging to your integrity? Curse God and die. And Job said to her, you are talking like a foolish woman. Will we receive good from God, but not also receive bad? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And even today, with a passage that is strange and confusing, uh, we say whenever we get to the end of scripture, as we read it together, the word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. What we encounter as we come to the end of this first passage in the series is Job and Job's wife speaking two sides of the same conundrum. You see, they both in that moment are trying to understand what is happening to Job. Now, it's important for us to remember that Job and his wife do not have the benefit of knowing what has been happening in the heavenly conversations, in the divine court. They haven't heard any of that. So they haven't heard what the adversary has said, what God has said. They are left only with what they are encountering on the human side of life. And what they are encountering is what feels like total devastation. And so surely the question of why and what in the world is going on is prominent. And so they are trying to understand what is happening. And in these last couple of verses that we read today, the wife looks at Job's circumstances and says, if this is how it is, after all that you've done, Job, after, you, all, after all the ways in which you have been faithful, if this is how it is, then God must be unreliable as an object of faith and trust. And Job looks at what has happened, and Job says to himself, if this is how it is, then God, you must have the freedom to be able to choose to do whatever you want to do. And just as you were able to bring good in my life, so you are able to bring bad in my life. Now, here's what I want you to hear. Both of those perspectives contain partial truths. But there's a real danger because we also take partial truths and turn them into complete gospel truth. There are partial truths here. But the problem is 
that mingled in with that partial truth is an assumption that both Job and his wife have made. And that assumption is that God is responsible for Job's condition. That God has done this to him and to them. And so for the wife then, that kind of a God is unreliable. And that is a truth because that kind of a God should be unreliable. A God who would arbitrarily, fleetingly do things to people to bring harm, to randomly say, I'll bless you with this, but I'm going to curse you with this. That is a God who should be unreliable and one that we would not want to have as the object of our faith and trust. And Job looks at the situation and says, well, if God can do good in my life, then I guess God is right, is, has the freedom to do bad in my life as well. Well, the partial truth there is that God does have the freedom to do as God wants because God alone is God. But, and this is a very important but, God will never act contrary to God's nature. And the very nature of God at the core of who God is, the God who we learn about across the sweeping arc of Scripture and across the sweeping arc of history and even our own lives, is that that God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Jacob, the God of the early church, the God of the church today, is a God of unwavering goodness. Job and Job's wife cannot see that unwavering goodness in the midst of the dark that they are sitting in. They cannot see, they cannot hear, they cannot recognize the one who they know has said, I know the plans I have for you, plans for your well-being, plans for a future with hope and a promise. The one who comes to us in the flesh, in the gospels, and says to us, come to me, all of you who are tired and who are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. The one who is the balm in Gilead that soothes our souls. This is a God of unwavering goodness and love. But Job and his wife can't see it in the dark. And neither can we sometimes, can we? We struggle in the dark to remember and to know and to trust and to be confident in the goodness, the unwavering goodness of God. And one of the reasons that is the case is because we have been conditioned. We have been conditioned, many of us, by the prosperity formula of the gospel. It's a formula that goes something like this. If I work hard, and if I do good, and if I treat other people right, and if I pray, and if I go to church, then I'm entitled, aren't I, to the good life, to a life that goes well and that is free of trouble. But that's not ever what the gospels say, is it, my friends? Jesus said, you know what, if you're going to follow me, there are going to be some tough times in this life. You're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. But I will be with you. We know from the story of Jesus' own life that it is not without pain and suffering, even though he lives the perfectly obedient life. There will be pain and suffering. The story of the early church 
tells that tale again and again as well. So where is the good news then? Where do we find a little good news today? Well, a couple of places I would suggest. One is this, that pain and suffering, when we encounter it, when you encounter it, does not mean that you have done something wrong. God is not out to get you. God is not out to cause you harm because you did something wrong. That is simply not the way pain and suffering works in this life. And so if you have struggled with that, if you have thought, what have I done to deserve this? Or where did I possibly go wrong that this is now happening to me? Life is not linear and simplistic in that way. There is not an equation or a, a pair of equations that says faithfulness equals blessing and faithlessness equals punishment. What we hear from scripture is that the sun rises on both the good and the evil and the rain falls on both the good and the evil. And so if that's the case, in the absence of that simplistic linear formula that would sure seem easier and more comfortable, but in the absence of that, then we have to choose differently how we're gonna respond in the face of pain and suffering. And one of the things we can do is to begin to put life in a proper perspective. To recognize that none of us are guaranteed anything. And to receive each day as a gift. At one point along that one year journey with Peyton and her family, she was on her way in for surgery And she could tell this little four-year-old who was very perceptive and had an incredibly deep faith, she could tell that her daddy, as he walked beside her bed on the way to the operating room, was worried. And Peyton looked up at him and said, it's okay, daddy. It's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. One day at a time. Receive it and live it as a gift. Some of you have probably gotten to know the name of Tyler Trent in the last few weeks. A young man who in high school was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, bone cancer. And Tyler, two weeks before uh, he was supposed to start college at Purdue University, had to go in for a major reconstructive surgery of his pelvic area. But he was absolutely committed to being at Purdue for his first day of school. And he was absolutely committed to camping out for however many hours he needed to to get tickets to the first home football game. And so Tyler became known as the Boilermakers superfan. And over the last year and a half, his journey has been shared by that team and by many others who have come to know not only his avid support for the Boilermakers, but his faith. Tyler died this past week on the 1st of January just a few days after he attended his last Purdue football game, their bowl game, where he was recognized as the honorary captain for the day. But just a couple of weeks before that, he wrote this in an article that uh, was for a publication on gratitude. He says, though I am in hospice care and have to wake up every morning knowing that the day might be my last, I still have a choice to make. To make that day the best it can be, to make the most of whomever comes to visit, text, tweet, or call me. 
Yet isn't that a choice we all have every day? Tyler continues. After all, nobody knows the amount of days we have left. Some could say we are all in hospice to a certain degree. And then Tyler shares what became his life scripture after he was diagnosed. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5. The first step that I would offer you today is to remember when you were in the dark who it is that is walking with you. Remember that it is a God of unwavering goodness who will be with you no matter what. And remember that when that one is walking with you, every day is a gift. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh God, there are mysteries that we do not understand and cannot know. And there are hardships that sometimes seem beyond bearing and beyond reason. And so we pray today for the gift of knowing, of being reassured that through it all you are with us. We are never alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.